This week's Bible study is based on Numbers in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. And please read through the passage before you come to watch this video. This story is another from the wanderings of Israel in the wilderness, and it depicts yet another occasion on which the people become their own worst enemy by rebelling against God. Their complaints against God and Moses succeed in provoking God to punishment. When they repent of their behaviour, God gives them the means to escape the consequences of their actions. As you will have seen, the details of the story are very odd, but the shape and the dynamic of the story should be a little bit familiar by now. Those who turn to God are treated with great mercy and grace. So let's look at the story a bit more closely. It's a very odd narrative, one that we probably don't know terribly well, but it's chosen as the Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent this year because it gets a mention in the Gospel reading, which is John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. In that Gospel reading, the story of the serpent becomes a motif for the saving power of Jesus, the crucified one, so hold that thought in mind as the parallels John draws with Jesus are significant. But let's also look at this Old Testament story on its own terms. And as you reflect on it further, you're invited to think about how it relates to Jesus and your experience of his saving love. The main problem that the Israelites face is a familiar one. It crops up over and over again in Exodus and in the stories of the wilderness experience. Israel had to leave Egypt where they had food and water and shelter, even though they were slaves. And they frequently seem to find themselves in situations where they are worried about their food, about where their food and drink will come from. The further Israel moves away from Egypt, the more the rose-tinted spectacles take effect. They perhaps seem even romantically nostalgic for the good old days in Egypt. And they certainly seem to have forgotten the burden of cruelty and abuse that they suffered. For example, when they were given no straw to make bricks, but were still expected to fulfil their quota. All they remember seems to be the guaranteed food supply, which the Egyptian empire provided for its slave labourers. That romantic, idealised memory contrasts with their present reality. Scarce supplies and danger in the wilderness. In verse 4 we read that they become impatient, but it seems to be more than that. Their impatience makes them argumentative and grumpy, and even mutinous. As is characteristic of many of the wilderness stories, while they carry the memory of how good things used to be, they quarrel. They accuse God of being unfaithful to them, of letting them down, and they accuse Moses of being a terrible leader. We can see if we look at many of the Psalms that Israel has a very candid relationship with God and their complaints against God can be quite harsh and abrasive, but often their accusation and protest results in good things from God. Generally, it might seem that the complaint impacts on God and God responds with good gifts for the people, but not this time, not in this story. In verse 6, we can see what the people get. We're not told why God doesn't respond with help this time. We don't know why this time God seems harsh and uncooperative. No good gifts are given, but instead the people receive a devastating punishment. The wilderness is already full of dangerous things, snakes and serpents and other poisonous creatures. These are now apparently sent by God in a lethal response to the people's complaint. Abruptly in verse 7, there is a turnaround. Faced with their own even greater suffering, the people who complained become repentant and submissive. And matching the complete U-turn of Israel, the God who has sent death now turns and provides a way for the people to find life and health. Verses 4 to 6 portray complaint and failure. But in contrast, verses 7 to 9 give a picture of humility and repentance and the corresponding generosity of God. In verse 7, when the people realise that they must make amends with God, they ask Moses to speak on their behalf and they want the poisonous snakes to be taken away quite naturally. Moses 
who himself has been the target of their complaining, does intercede for them. The snakes, though, are not taken away, but rather God provides a way for the people to find healing and life despite their presence. When the people accuse, God responds negatively, but when they submit, God responds positively. There are other instances in the Old Testament where Yahweh is depicted as holding the power to give life or to cause death, and the people are implicitly invited to choose what they want. For example, you could look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, or Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. In this passage today, God, through Moses, produces a bronze replica of the thing that wounds. It sounds a bit like the hair of the dog. This statue is visible to all Israel and it seems to function in an almost magical way as an antidote to the poisonous snakes. On the surface, this seems like a very odd and perhaps even superstitious solution to the breakdown in the covenantal relationship. Because Israel was rebellious, God sent real destructive snakes. When Israel was penitent, God sent a saving snake. I find this personally quite an uncomfortable story to read, particularly as it resonates with the tactics and methods of many tyrannical regimes. In recent weeks, we've heard a lot in the news about the extreme measures the Myanmar military are employing to quash any sign of rebellion and dissent. And it's hard to read a passage in which God appears to employ similar tactics. Despite the fact that a cure or antidote is given, that the people can look at a bronze servant and live, in verse 9, it's hard to read that the snakes are apparently sent to do God's will in the first place. And I don't have a solution for that. It's one of those troubling things that I'm still grappling with. And almost just as problematic is the idea of the magical solution. Particularly in the Protestant tradition, we reject the idea that a sacred object can be the means by which miraculous healing is achieved. But perhaps we can move beyond this second difficulty more easily than the first. Surely we're invited to think about the bronze serpent sacramentally. After all, the claim and the function of the bronze serpent are not, in principle, so very different from the idea that bread and wine mediate the body and blood of Jesus to us in saving ways. Both the image of the bronze serpent and our own experience of the sacrament of communion remind us that God's life-giving power is given in ways that are not contained or understood by our logic and rationality. If we then turn to the Gospel reading, John chapter 3 verses 14 to 21, John understands that the lifted up, elevated bronze servant is an anticipation of the lifted up, crucified Jesus. And it's just as much beyond our logic and reason to understand how a crucified, lifted up Jesus can have saving power over the whole world for all time. The claim might seem odd, but this lifted up Jesus stands at the very centre of a redefined existence. This story of the Old Testament, particularly in connection with the Gospel, invites us to reorient ourselves, to be re-centred around that gift of new life, that Jesus offers to the whole world. If you'd like to reflect on this passage a bit further, there are some questions that might help. So read through the passage again several times slowly and take notice of any words or phrases that stand out for you. Can you think of any times when your nostalgia for the past has led you to grumbling and negativity about present circumstances? How does this story challenge your attitudes to what you have and where you are? How do you respond to the idea that there may be a parallel with the sacrament of communion here? Does this help or hinder your reading of the story? How does John's interpretation of the crucified Jesus as being like the bronze serpent add to your understanding? Spend a little bit of time in prayer, offering to God those times when you have lost sight of God's goodness because you've been looking elsewhere or you've had your head firmly stuck in the past. Invite the healing, life-giving Holy Spirit to fill your life today.